We are in Kulsek on the premises of the Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, Kulsek, uh, and uh, we have just listened to a presentation by Professor Ori Shri from the University of Bonn. The presentation dealt with the new world order emerging now as a result of the uh, Russian aggression against the Ukraine, and uh, Professor Shri gave us an insight into the uh, motives of decision makers in Europe and to some extent also in Russia. However, my question, my first question, doesn't relate to the substance of the presentation, but rather the decision making processes and especially the, that of the key country uh, in the EU, Germany. We remember that uh, close to 40 years ago, there was a big, big discussion among uh, German historians and politicians, so sort the of famous historical side, historian discussion. And uh, this uh, had, I think, a major impact also on, on politics in Germany. Now, do you think that historical issues, uh, something like the atmosphere of the mid-'80s, uh, is available today now. So Putin is drawing lots of, seems to be drawing lots of lessons from history, keeps referring to history. Do German decision makers also draw lessons from history? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this wonderful place here, although it's a rainy day here um, on the um, Austrian-Hungarian border. Um, the answer is, um, Yes, I hope that we should have learned our lessons from history and uh, history uh, as, for example, the lesson um, never war from German soul um, is fundamentally and key for the decision-making process in, in, in Germany. Um, we try to do our best to learn from history, but sometimes um, um, the impact of history is too strong to draw our own conclusions, and sometimes history is also misused as an argument or um, taken as an argument to abstain from resuming responsibilities and taking over responsibilities which um, are now in a completely different world and Germany is under serious observation from its partners. You have no written, history. You have written extensively about memory politics in Germany and you also devoted a number of books to von Stauffenberg who uh, was responsible, greatly responsible for the July 20th, 1944 plot. Now, uh, can you think of, under the present circumstances, with all the necessary changes, such outstanding personalities who, in a very critical situation, uh, can uh, see uh, very much ahead, like Stauffenberg was trying to look ahead, that uh, it was very difficult to imagine in 19... Uh, in July 1944, how the war would end. But Stauffenberg had a vision, mm -hmm. and he was ready to sacrifice his life. Now, you as a great expert in Stauffenberg, can you see uh, any similarities? Can you think of any politician, or perhaps not just politician, but public intellectual of that format who can foresee like Stauffenberg could at that time? What we can learn from Stauffenberg and the men of the German resistance is also the men of the resistance in uh, resistance in France or the resistenza in Italy or in other countries is that what is key and what counts in the long run is character mm -hmm. and courage. Uh, and if you look at the statesmen and the lessons we can draw from statesmanship in the 20th century, then it needs character and courage for the real statesmen, for a transformational agenda. 
you you see that when you study uh, Konrad Adenauer or Charles de Gaulle. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, in our times, where are the, the key leaders and where are these personalities? Um, we had Václav Havel um, after 1989, and he also had a tremendous transformational impact on his own country. And we certainly had uh, Pope John Paul II in the Roman Catholic Church, also from Poland, who had a transformational agenda. Um, it's too early to make a final judgment on the acting um, politicians, and sometimes um, you have a great disappointment um, when you look at someone who started with great ambitions and hopes and who ended um, in a not so good shape. But it's too early to make final judgments and we will see in the long run who will have which entry in the history books. May I bring a Polish example, the, the example of Valencia, so who yeah. had, I think you can easily compare his impact on Polish history to that of Havel and also on the overall history of the region. Still, his uh, reputation and his prestige is somehow a matter of the past. So he... Uh, so there are uh, personalities who are very successful for a while, and then, and as a result of the changing circumstances, they have no impact anymore. He could mobilize 10 million people or so with Solidarność, and uh, by now he's not considered to be such a decisive uh, personality. You, you might have observed that I did not put uh, Lech Walesa in the line of those who whom I mentioned, as I said, it's it's about character and and, okay. and, and courage. And there's also uh, the moment of history. Um, uh, Gorbachev was the man of the year in, in the Time magazine of mm -hmm. the year 1990. And he certainly had uh, a somewhat revolutionary approach. Uh, but um, when you touch Gorbachev in history, and then you have to look at his whole career, and also the role he played in, in, in Russia in, in the last couple of years and his early career as well. But may I use this uh, argument of yours now in connection with Putin? Because mm -hmm. Putin has also uh, held uh, the uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, transform, has played an important role in the post-Soviet transformation and for a while seems to have stabilized uh, Russia. Uh, whereas uh, by now, uh, Gorbachev's uh, memory is more connected to the collapse of the Soviet Union, whereas for many people, the impact of Putin, at least for the time being, of course it might undergo lots of changes, is that of consolidation and stabilization. Is that the case? Yeah, Putin is a good, good example. I mean, um, um, and that brings us to the speculation if um, Adolf Hitler had died in the year 1937 or 1938, um, how would we um, look back at his um, career? Um, uh, but Putin has ruined his, all, mm -hmm. his own image within a couple of months, within um, one sole decision to invade Ukraine in February last year. Um, otherwise, Putin would have been remembered um, uh, as an extremely influential politician who transformed his country, um, who increased the strategic um, platform for Russian foreign policy, who acted, uh, uh, who acted uh, as a key player um, uh, in the Syrian um, uh, crisis who took profit from weaknesses of others. But with this single decision uh, to invade an independent state, Ukraine, I think he completely ruined his entry in the history book. It's, um, too early to make a, a final judgment in this case as well. But um, 
we possibly will see more negative surprises from Putin as he has now uh, <coughs> burned the bridges. Um, and I cannot imagine that Putin can return to normal diplomacy after that uh, terrible mistake, also a strategic mistake if you look at it from a Russian perspective. Following your presentation during the discussion, several references were made to possible mediators who can help in, in finishing the war. And the reference was made to Turkey, reference made was to Brazil. And uh, if, uh, I understand your uh, judgment of Putin now. Uh, Munich of 2024, when influential great powers meet Putin, and discuss the option, this is no more the option? You should always give diplomacy a chance. And mm -hmm. as you know, um, strategy is defined um, as the unity of diplomacy and military strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, wars end either by total defeat, uh, unconditional surrender, or by um, diplomatic compromises, peace settlements, as we call it. So um, perhaps there is on my side a lack of imagination that Putin can return to the conference table. I think he has, he has um, as I mentioned it earlier, burned the bridges mm -hmm. and that um, for him the war is a question of life and death and also of the continuity of his rule. Uh, but I wish that someone who will succeed Putin in a not too distant future mm -hmm. um, will have the character um, and also the rationale to um, end this war by a settlement. <coughs> If we still use the historical example, you were talking about the necessity of a unity and uh, military preparation of the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean that under the present circumstances, what the EU needs is not a Chamberlain type of person, but a Churchill type of person, who, who is uh, clearly defining the aims, not ready for compromise, so because you, in your scholarly uh, work, you have devoted much attention to this unconditional surrender problem. Uh, can unconditional surrender be an option? Uh, because th that uh, might perhaps be a very strong argument, but it can achieve the opposite as well. So, As Mark Twain said, never make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> um, um, I cannot foresee that uh, we will have an unconditional mm -hmm. surrender of Russia. Um, so um, I would very much argue in favor um, of a settlement which will allow the Ukrainian nation to survive and to preserve mm -hmm. unity and to have more security guarantees than Ukraine had before the war, uh, I think we cannot we cannot overcome history and we cannot um, um, overcome what we have seen in the last uh, 15 months. Um, and I think we have to um, develop some kind of understanding and security guarantees which will Ukraine uh, not only allow to continue their path to European um, Atlantic institutions, but also to make sure that they will never again be invaded by an aggressor. Uh, may I ask, we do not have much time left, uh, uh, ask a question which is a bit uh, different from the topic of your presentation, that is, you have written about German places of memory. And is this the Pierre Nora type of approach to the problem? And what do you consider to be the major places of, of German memory? The major 
places of German memory can be found in the capital in, in, mm -hmm. in Berlin. There you have in close neighborhood uh, the German Reichstag, uh, a symbol uh, today of the transparency of German democracy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also um, a building uh, uh, located uh, in former times at the borderline between East and West in Germany, a situation... Uh, a monument where, um, which was accused by the German Kaiser um, as a kind of Schwarzbude. Um, and that monument stands for the problems and pitfalls of uh, German history. <clears throat> and in close neighborhood to the um, Reichstag building, you have the Holocaust Memorial, um, which um, uh, reminds us of the um, atrocities uh, of the murders of the European Jews among the National Socialist era committed by Germans. And uh, this is still uh, a legacy which is uh, stronger than uh, everything else and which is a driving force for German diplomacy uh, to say never again. And in neighborhood to the Holocaust uh, Memorial, um, you have the Wilhelmstrasse uh, with everything which has been demolished mm -hmm. by air power in uh, World War II. And you have so many, um, so many uh, remembrance of what went wrong in German history uh, in this capital uh, that uh, I think these monuments uh, remind us that there should be um, a strong incentive for German foreign and security policy to make a contribution to a safer and better world. Uh, when you are speaking about uh, places, uh, memorial places of German history, you would limit it to Berlin? Or uh, are there any other monuments in any other uh, major uh, German town that you would consider to be symbolic of, of Germany? No, Germany is a, federal, uh, is a federal country. And when you go to Munich and... Uh, look at the traces of the National Socialist mm -hmm. Braunes House in Munich and uh, when you look at also um, the memories of the uh, uh, Bavarian past of King Louis I and his um, admiration for uh, the Greek um, uh, period, um, when you look at um, the Paulskirche also um, in Frankfurt, um, mm -hmm. which stands for the democratic tradition of the German parliament, but also for um, um, uh, the social and political revolution in 1848 and the outcome um, when we look um, at the long road to unity in 1871, there are many, many... Um, um, leftovers uh, when you look at the so-called Bismarck towers uh, which you can find all over the country um, which recall that the German Kaiserreich uh, after 1871 struggled with uh, the cause to um, uh, many aspects of social um, security but also to um, world um, politics um, that they missed Bismarck tremendously so that they built these towers and um, I think all these memories uh, do remind us that we have a long and complicated uh, history and that history should be seen as a driving force 
to engage in politics. Let me, in conclusion, return to, to Europe. Do you think that the German federal structure can serve as an example for the structure of the EU? My piece of advice would always be to be careful in hammering home messages and to bring, um, as the Brits say that, the law to the lesser breeds. Uh, so I think Europe has been founded uh, in the late Middle Ages by the nations. Uh, and we should never underestimate and neglect the power of the nation state. Europe can only flourish when we bring together the strength of these nation, nations and their nation states. And um, that also means that we should not give the impression to have the intention to create a kind of Brussels superstate. So the federal structure, um, and the key word is subsidiarity, is a recipe for the European Union, but that um, piece of advice and that um, recommendation should not lead to the conclusion to neglect the strength of the nation states and that we need, desperately need, these nations and nation states to form Europe as a political actor on the world stage in the 21st century. I think I'll ask you one after the last question because at the beginning of your presentation you, you argue that in times of crisis uh, history is speeding up. Mm -hmm. And uh, things that uh, were uh, an open question for years or decades seem to be, or at least seem to be, or are perceived as if they had been solved. Now, uh, the only thing that uh, I fully agree with your point concerning the, the national state, but if the decision-making processes of the EU, especially in times of crisis, have to be fast and efficient, isn't there some kind of a temporary need to, to limit the, the impact of the national states? Yeah, but can you allow me uh, mm -hmm. the question? Can you imagine um, a Hungarian stamp of approval to majority voting when it comes to question of defense and national security. I think it's it's quite an illusion to think that majority voting can be um, can be used for every issue when it comes to such um, critical questions as defense and national security. So thank you very much. I think uh, we had a very interesting presentation about the changing world order and the role of Europe in this uh, new world order. And thank you very much also that within the framework of this conversation for putting it into a broader historical context. Thank, thank you, you so much for the invitation and for um, your interest and all the best. Thank you very much. Yes.